<clears throat> we're gonna get started. Um, what we have is several uh, students who have completed internships over the past semester and maybe two. And they have a lot of experience, not only in this, uh, some of them not only with this particular internship, but with others. So what we hope to do is for them to do a very short, short, short <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, because we've got so many, we've got 70, 70 minutes now. Uh, so you've got six or seven minutes to sort of cover the key topics of who you worked for, what you did, what you learned from it, tie it back to the classroom activity, make us professors feel like we do something valuable. <laughs> And then what you might recommend to the crew, as far as that goes. So it's all your time. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Britton Rahu. I'm a senior, so I got about a week and a half left. <laughs> and I did a spring internship with State Farm. I was an account representative, which is just a different title for financial advisor in a sense. So some of the duties and responsibilities I had to do was I had to obtain my Georgia property and casual and my life accident and sickness um, license so that I could actually and legally sell certain products. Um, so what I do is I cover auto, homeowners, uh, life, health, and I do some banking stuff. Um, in the internship, I didn't really get to do the banking stuff as much as I'd hoped to just because it's a little bit more advanced, but as I go full time with them in the summer, that's when I'll kind of switch into the banking stuff. So um, so typically what I do was, I had to get there at eight o'clock in the morning most days, it wasn't fun, but um, uh, open up my emails, check what I have to do, um, go through our internet leads or phone leads, and just kind of cold call some people or Luckily, I was able to have somewhat of a natural market from being up here for four years um, and would just kind of talk to clients or potential clients at that time. Um, do a little bit of a fact finder, you know, find out, you know, some personal things, uh, income, you know, kind of just running through that stuff. And then I would meet with them, hopefully, and we would sit down. I'd go through, you know, again, that fact finder. And then I'd build up a little bit of a portfolio to see what package would best work for them. Uh, now, I mainly stuck with life insurance because that was somewhat of my specialty. Um, my father uh, worked for Northwestern Mutual, so I kind of grew up under that belt. Um, so I kind of just, again, stuck with life insurance. Um, did pretty well. Luckily, I had a couple sales. Um, so again, I would just kind of like work out a package for them. And the next slide will hopefully, I think it's the next one, one after that will show like the two basic types of life insurance, and it's term life and whole life. Um, kind of just a quick description. Term life is usually like a cheaper policy. Obviously, it's a term, um, you know, usually 10, 15, or 20 years. And again, if it was a lower income client, I would usually try to prefer and push them towards that just because I wanted to not over insure them and definitely not under. Obviously, it's kind of sucks. No one wants to talk about life, but um, uh, and then the next is whole life, which obviously is my personal favorite, um, just because there's so many perks to it. And obviously, it's a hot, higher policy and uh, more expensive premiums, which is more expensive monthly. Um, but what you get in a sense is um, the return you get in a sense is a lot. So the connection with coursework. Um, so I'm a political science major. Um, luckily, I was able to get in here to the business. Um, but I'd say, from being a political science major, it definitely taught me the preciseness and accountability you have to have and discipline. Those are the three I'd take home. It wasn't necessarily what assignments made us do, but how political science majors had to interact with professors and others in the class. Um, I think that was my biggest takeaway. And, you know, really valuing the opinion of others and really being precise in how you respond and how you have to be accountable for what you want to say and how you have to back it up and be factual. So that was kind of it. Because if I go to a client and you know they're a lower income client and I try and push a big policy on them and they can't afford it and they have to cancel it, then it comes back and haunts me in the end. So 
Excellent. So anyway, for recommendations, I would definitely say do an internship, just because the things I learned in just a few months that I did an internship was beyond that I could see. I mean, just going in there every day and you know learning life lessons and learning how the real world actually is, as it's unfortunately daunting upon me in a couple of weeks. Um, was just that, I mean, and the A-Lab here in Oglethorpe, I mean, just being in Atlanta, you just have to take advantage of it. Um, I mean, I wish I did one earlier. I definitely wish I did a couple semesters before, but I'm glad I did it the last semester just because, again, it was just, um, the experience was um, just amazing and just, I couldn't have asked for anything better. So. One, maybe two questions if it's short. Then, then we'll, we'll open it. If we have time left over, which I hope to. Can professors ask questions? Absolutely. Okay. Only if they're tough. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got licensed. Did State Farm pay for that license? Yes. Did they pay for your training yeah. well, and all that? Of course, I had to put it up front mm -hmm. because if I failed, then they're like, see ya. Okay. <laughs> but I luckily passed, so they reimbursed me. And do you plan on staying with State Farm? Yeah, I'm actually, uh, on May 22nd, it's actually my first official full day. Oh, there really? at the <laughs> I got 10 days of summer, so I'm going to use it to then, then another 30 years of work. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Good job. Carol.
my recommendation was that it's a great experience, and it also boosts your resume, and future employers look at from my experience. So I got a better understanding about marketing and promotional context, so what kind of things can be used to market over the work, which correlates like in different skills. So being an HR major, I can use that in recruiting and like talent acquisition. So those are skills that I'm using and that I improved on that I could put on my resume. Um, with the projects that I did, I'm able to add it to my portfolio and I added it to my LinkedIn. And so at Tree, uh, my summer internship that I just received, they looked at my LinkedIn and she actually looked at all my projects that I uploaded to my LinkedIn and she was very impressed by my work. And she wants to use things that I did here in my summer internship. So that's what I mean by future employers. They can use these projects and apply it to their um, workplace. And then it was very flexible being a student athlete. I wanted an internship, but also needed something that worked with my very busy schedule. So they were very um, understanding when they could come in or if I needed to change my hours last minute. Um, so I really enjoyed those aspects. Any questions? Um, how did you get your second internship? For my summer one? Yes. So using LinkedIn, a lot of places that you apply to now, they ask for a professional profile. So not only do you upload, upload your resume and your cover letter, but they want you to upload your LinkedIn. So I applied to over 10 places, and one of them um, that, I, that she called me for a phone interview, she was really impressed by my LinkedIn, and she saw like all the projects that I had uploaded, and she said, like, even though you're, or it was for HR, and she said, the same skill that you have, we want to use that and use some of your marketing knowledge here, too. So now, with the new technology, you know, making recruitment videos and making, like, promotional context to recruit employees is very uh, popular now. I have a follow-up question, then. So, as part of that content, was there that brilliant piece of work you did for the class that you have a distinguished professor do the voiceover wrong? Is that part of the content? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> so, what, what Dr. Birchfield is referring to is that in my recruitment selection class last fall, Dr. Birchfield narrated my recruitment video that was an assignment to recruit Southwest. Promptly student recruitment. <laughs> <laughs> and so that video was also on my LinkedIn and my employers, and my future employer. Um, are, are you going to say more job spots? <laughs> well, you know how it is. That's that's right. Supplementary <laughs> income, I mean, you know, that's absolutely that's necessary. Side gig is going to be doing voiceovers. That's for right, that's right. I'm always going to do a cartoon voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, for y'all's taxes next year, uh, here are some of the changes. So the significance of all of these are the fact that they impact how certain things were filed this year and how they will be filed next year. Um, so this year was the last year that we were kind of under the 2017 tax law changes, but they had to take these into consideration because this is, again, what will be happening next year. So um, I just included some examples of the changes that I saw most of in the accounting firm. Um, so one, moving expenses are no longer tax deductible. This can be exempted for um, military and very special circumstances, but for the most part, they used to be tax deductible. Now they're not. Um, also, paid alimony is no longer tax deductible, so this impacts those receiving alimony because the alimony no longer counts as income, um, which means it's not tax deductible for them, so they get to keep more money. Pardon? I'm sorry. I'm this is the stuff they remember in class. Yeah, yeah well, you know, that's funny <laughs> since I doubt that many of you at this point are suffering from alimony. <laughs> but but it's, it's a critical part and an angry part of negotiation, or has been up to now, in many divorces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a lot of the, the is child, you know, do you, do you label it as child support, which was not deductible, or as alimony, which was deductible, and there's right. an argument back and forth, and now, doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, yeah, it also impacts those making the alimony payments um, because they no longer get to deduct them, so they're kind of losing the situation. Um, and then the alternative minimum tax um, is finally been adjusted for inflation. So this isn't necessarily a change, it's more like an update. Um, I just wanted to include it just to show that people really are just digging through the entire tax law and just revamping everything. So they've just updated it to kind of apply to the value of money now. Um, also, the standard deduction has doubled and the personal exemption has disappeared. And this actually um, was something we talked about in the office and it primarily impacts people with children because they're no longer able to deduct per child. So um, the, per the standard deduction, like say your standard deduction is $6,000. That just means for you, you get to double that and that's $12,000. Um, and a deduction means you just take it out of what you have to pay. So um, that's that. So that's great for individuals, but for a per the personal exemption, if I have four kids, I can no longer deduct each of them. Um, and to put that in perspective, the personal exemption this year was forty fifty. So that's four hundred four thousand fifty dollars um, that you don't get to take away per child. So it kind of impacts that as well. Um, also, most of the savings that the 2018 tax law kind of provides you will disappear in 2025, so the biggest question is what's going to happen after that. Um, I don't have an answer, um, but it's going to be a very different time, but it's also a huge consideration for why we're making the changes we are now and what those changes are. So would I recommend an internship? Absolutely. Um, it was really helpful because you get valuable professional experience. Part of what I mean by that is you get to learn how to engage with a boss or a superior as well as like coworkers and stuff. So it's very different than asking a teacher for help. Um, but it's also just knowing how to ask a superior for help, actually going into the office and saying, I don't know how to do this. It's very humbling and um, it's a really good experience to get as a student. Um, hands on learning, um, you really get to learn kind of what's significant. Like you'll see kind of patterns of what you see more of and less of. So you kind of get to see where the stuff you learn in the classroom applies. Um, real world perspective and familiarity with current technology and programs. Um, they have a tax package, which is just you basically go on their computer, fill out the forms that the people send you in, like their W-2s, 1099s, all that stuff. Um, and then the tax thing calculates it for you. So you just have to know kind of where to input what and what counts for each year. So it's still a lot of thinking, but it's not as much calculation. So just kind of being up to speed with all of that um, is really helpful. So those are my references, and that's it. Questions for Evan? How did she get that Bagos internship? How about that? Uh, yeah, it was an email. <laughs> it was an email. That's it was a good it, yeah. one taxes. Um, it was the email. <laughs> that was the internship that was available. Um. I don't know, uh, I just knew I needed an internship and so I responded to that and I thought taxes would be interesting, especially being in the tax class. Um, and it was interesting because when I first started accounting at the end of my sophomore year, like this is very new, um, they said auditing was better because you kind of get more hands-on experience with a bunch of different things, but um, tax actually was a lot more diverse than I expected. It's also very personal, I mean you see the clients come into the office, you're engaging with real people. Um, so I guess, yeah, tax just kind of happened and it was pretty cool. Is that through accounting major? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a Will you plan on doing a second internship? Will you have time for that? Yes, absolutely. Um, this summer I'm going to stay on with the same firm and they're going to let me do even more kind of accounting things like payroll and all of that. Um, and then I'm intending to get an internship next spring. So. Absolutely.
So you will be attending the fall. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, it's a great source, man. Introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Maya. I'm an economics major, sophomore, and this semester I interned at Make with Georgia, the corporate development intern. Um, 20 hours a week under the VP of um, Development and Events. Um, just a little bit about Make Wish, try to keep it quick. Um, our mission statement Make Wish Georgia creates life changing wishes for um, children battling illnesses. So we say it affects everyone um, families, the um, medical professionals, the communities, and the donors um, that are all involved in creating a wish. And this is where my department comes in. We raise money to make all of this happen. Um, just an example of a wish. Um, this kid's named Cohen, he's five from McDonough, um, has cancer and he wished to go to Disney World, which is also our most common wish. Um, just more figures to show how um, wishes affect everyone. 97% of wish families say that um, wish kids, their wish has helped their emotional health, um, as well as a positive influence on their health. And 71% of, which is my favorite statistics, of um, surviving kids have said that a wish has contributed to saving their lives. Um, our local impact at Make-A-Wish. So as we raise money um, as a nonprofit organization, every single dollar that we raise stays in Georgia, and actually 80% of our um, money goes directly to making wishes come true. So I hope that's pretty cool. Okay, so my responsibilities as a corporate development intern. Um, I conducted corporate research for um, prospective corporations that we create partners with, um, create their portfolios, do their research, um, read their financial statements, and um, see what their status in finance is. Um, I made presentations for um, corporations and their proposals as um, my supervisors make proposals and ask if different companies, I put those presentations together, get feedback from them, um, prepare for their internal kickoffs for um, different events that corporations held, um, or for adopt wish events, and things like that. Um, as well as donor retention, keeping up with our donors, and um, you know, through phone calls and letters and making sure that we're doing everything we can to keep our relationship healthy, um, as well as dealing with all the PR on the corporate side. Um, applicable classroom knowledge, um, financial accounting with Mr. Birchfield um, taught me how to read financial statements, <laughs> um, which actually came in handy a lot when um, we're doing research on different um, corporations that we do have partners, partnerships with and um, that we're trying to develop partnerships with to see if it's something that they can afford. <laughs> Um, principles of management, just like um, uh, Make Wish is a nonprofit, but just like any corporation, they have several several departments that um, are all run under different executives, but all come together to um, work for the same mission. Um, so those are just basics that you know you don't think about, but you learn in class like this. And just simple as um, the professionalism that you learn in the classroom, the way you speak to your professors is similar to the same respect you speak to your um, supervisors with. Um, the punctuality and the accountability that you're held to in a classroom is the same accountability that I'm held to. I hold myself to in um, the workplace. Um, just some example of ongoing semester projects that I worked on. Um, two of our um, partners that run campaigns with us, Brooks Brothers and Applebee's, which you guys have heard of this. Um, so I kind of helped run those campaigns from the Make-A-Wish side, um, organized all the meetings with them, um, sent them all the collateral they needed for their um, spring campaign and their kickoff, put together the um, kickoff celebrations that they have and dealt with the PR. Um, some advice for future interns. Professionalism is a big one. Um, hold yourself accountable. Punctuality is a big one. Um, attire, grooming, all of that kind of stuff. Um, get involved both within Oldler and without, outside of Oldler. Um, build your connections and um, apply to several jobs. Um, keep an open mind. You almost get the first internship you apply for, but um, I don't know. And take initiative. Be a self-starter. Um, Go after what you want. I say, um, you know, call the company back, see, follow up with them. Um, and in an internship, you have to take initiative more than I think you would um, in a classroom. Just another example of a wish kid in saying that um, we think that wishes help a lot in medical uh, treatment. All right, any questions? Do you entertain questions while Jay? Get your slides covered. How did you get it? Um, so I applied online. Um, I'm a part of Kai Omega and we do a lot of work with Make-A-Wish, so um, I knew a lot about them through that and um, then I went on their website and saw that they have a event and I know some girls who've done it before, so I applied and interviewed and talked about it. Any other questions? Yes? Zero dollars an hour. <laughs> it's a nonprofit, they can't afford to pay their interns, but the experience is priceless. 
And that's an important point because not only do you guys have experience that is valuable to you, but it's becoming more competitive in the workplace. In many areas, it's almost required that you have an internship or two because companies want to see that you've been out there, you've done something professional, and you kind of like what they do. They don't want to bring you on and after a year of training you and not really making a lot of money out of you, find out you don't like working there, right? That kind of a business. So, uh, paid or unpaid, internships are important to get on your resume to be competitive with all the other students who are going to have. Introduce yourself to Coach Jane. Hello, I'm Jacia Millen. I go by Jane. Oh, this is Jacia. Um, and I'm an Adam major computer science minor, and over the spring I interned at Coke Industries. And I have here like a very brief description of who Coke is. Because when you say Coke, most people think Coca Cola. Um, but this is, and they're right by Coca Cola too, to make it more confusing in the city. So what they are is kind of like this um, central hub um, for all these different subsidiaries that they own. They don't really do one thing specific. They kind of just um, micromanage all these different companies that they bought, like um, Georgia Pacific, Vista, Molex, and that, and those companies, they work um, on like paper, packaging, electronics, um, chemistry for like fertilizers and whatnot, a bunch of um, different things in the U.S. and across the world. And what I did, I was on their Molex team, um, and um, I was helping that team work on their international tax compliance. And Molex has presence all over the world. They have offices in Singapore, Brazil, Japan, um, China, Korea, Israel. And what I did is I helped prepare the 5471s and 5858s, and those are forms for foreign entities who are filing their taxes in the U.S. Um, I also helped with the 8802s, which is basically filing for a uh, residency in the U.S., which is required to um, kind of fund money back and forth. I also helped with preparing different schedules for those entities to handle like the exchange rate differences, um, the trees. It's interesting because there's a lot of strategy involved where um, Coke would set up different entities in like the Netherlands or Caymans or Bermuda because those are like tax havens and have low tax rates and some have no tax rate at all. And um, we would have to work on the strategy to make sure that cash could flow through there back up to the U.S. And just all these different things. And with the new um, tax laws coming out with reform, we had to rearrange how we were going to have our structures to handle those things. So um, <laughs> it was a very, very busy semester. Um, and as far as like relevant classroom skills, definitely just knowing accounting in general. Not like remembering 90% of all the things you learn, but just knowing <laughs> debits and credits. Um, they don't expect to teach you at Coke what a debit and a credit is. They expect you to know what your assets, your liabilities, your contra assets, your contra liabilities, um, because they don't want to spend time on things that can um, be taught in the classroom. They want to teach you strategy. They want you to come in and learn, hey, you know, we've got this situation. How can you approach it already knowing kind of your basic accounting things? So that is very important. But again, it's not like 90%. They don't expect you to remember um, like a hedging <laughs> or advance. <laughs> They're not going to expect you to know that um, or even just putting together a balance sheet from scratch. We have controllers to do that. We have ways to automate that. They don't expect you to know that, but they expect you to know how to read it, how to read your balance sheets, your income statements, and all that. So when you look at a balance sheet and say you see your cash um, account with a credit balance, you know instantly you get to that account and see why it has the credit balance and so the debt balance. Um, so it's just little things like that. And another thing I put was the ability to articulate through written words. Um, there's a lot of back and forth emails between like controllers in different countries, um, your managers, your seniors, um, and it's definitely useful when you write essays and whatnot and when you work on presentations to know how to put together words and how to use portray what you want to say properly because if you put something that may seem 
not even offensive, but defensive or anything, then um, it's very easy to get caught into a long email. Like, what, what exactly do you mean by that? Um, and what's that happen to other people? <laughs> and then again, Coke, um, because they're caught in between this international um, tax relation and then all this reform, the ability to learn is very important. Um, there's, there's an ongoing learning experience there. There's, nothing stays the same. Um, it's, I've worked easily um, 45 hours on average a week, and I don't even feel it just because there's so many things to learn. Um, it's, it's a great environment, but it's fascinating. And then my recommendation for like future students who might be interested in code or just interested um, in like international tax, um, definitely be engaged in class. Like I said, you don't need to remember everything, but just understanding the core concepts are very important because when you get those, into those kind of environments, you need to understand how to think because you're going to get from so many different questions. Um, it's helpful to just know how to think. Like to talk to you and your professor about your interests, um, just because it helps you think about what you want to do. Like at Coke, they have a whole bunch of different teams. They have their state team, their foreign tax credit team, they have their transfer pricing team, they have their international compliance team, which I, which I was on. And um, I think that team really thought it would be interesting. So it helps to kind of have kind of your pre-idea of what you like to do. And like to, um, it helps to kind of be active in your major and utilize resources on campus just because um, it's just good to know this when going into Coke specifically. It's a very Last semester, I worked at Cox Automotive as a solutions engineer. So basically, what I did, I uh, yeah, there you go. I was basically the middleman between stakeholders and the developers. So when someone submitted a ticket to enhance their system and their current business process, I was the guy that came up with the idea to how to make it more efficient and get to the right places at the right times. And I would put that in writing for the developer so that he could create it. And we, the developer would have to spend so much time working with the stakeholder to eventually create this process. Um, some of the responsibilities that I had was I would respond to emails with the stakeholder. I would also work on lots of tickets regarding project time entry. Um, Cox just started this new process where every single employee has to book time to certain projects that they work on, even salaried employees. And it's really tough getting salaried employees to book time because sometimes I feel like they're above that. Um, so we were constantly dealing with people that were going against this process. And uh, other things that I, I worked on were dashboards and reports. I would create them so that 
other people and other stakeholders would have more visibility on what they're working with and how they can uh, see the problems and what needs to be focused on more often in their business processes. Uh, how Overflow prepared me, uh, my business administration class, entrepreneurship class, and energy finance class, they all made me work in a team environment and when I'm developing solutions for my uh, stakeholders, what we would have to do is we would get in a team, we would talk to our team and we would figure out like what meets best practice and what we could do to eventually you know, not have to deal with this later in the future, so it's like the best thing possible for them right now. Um, for corporate finance, financial accounting, managerial accounting, um, they helped me uh, advance my Excel skills. Everything I worked with was pretty, was pretty much Excel. Um, if I didn't have to you know, create, create uh, Excel documents for these classes, I definitely wouldn't have been ready for some of the tax some of the tasks I was uh, approached with. Uh, business law, macroeconomics, and microeconomics. Um, it helps you see like the bigger picture and the smaller picture and some of the problems that stakeholders are facing and for a corporation and all. And Cal 2 was by far my toughest class I've taken so far. And you know, working through that really helps me like teach myself and some of the things that I had to overcome. And recommendations for you guys. Uh, if you want to get an internship, definitely you know, maintain above a 3.0 GPA. You know, every time I was talking to someone about getting an internship, they always were like, what's your GPA? Because that's kind of your experience that you have. Um, dress presentably when you go to these, these interviews and you know, just around campus. So if you find an opportunity with your family or you're out somewhere and you're networking, uh, you look presentable. Um, another one would be follow up on every single internship opportunity because even though you think that you may have bombed an interview or things aren't going too well or you don't think you're going to get it or you haven't heard back from them in a while, reach out to them. Uh, it's, they're, they're not being annoyed, so definitely that too. And get involved in things outside of the Oakland community because that's primarily how you're going to find an internship. Questions? Questions? They come. <laughs> so, how did you find an internship? Um, so, what I did was I networked a lot. I met a lot of people, and you know, through my friends uh, and my my family, and uh, I would interview at one place, and you know, maybe they wouldn't have a position that fits me perfectly, but they recommend me somewhere else, and then they would recommend me somewhere else too, and eventually I found a spot that fit me perfectly. Or they thought I fit them perfectly. <laughs> Are you saying you don't feel like you fit there perfectly? Um, you know, <laughs> it's okay. It's, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy so it sometimes. You don't stay there. Uh, I mean, I don't mind staying there. That's, okay. I like it sometimes. <laughs> it's tough. Any more questions? James. Yes, sir. Can everybody see me? I'm a little low to the ground. Can everybody see me? Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. I apologize in advance then. Well, I, read, I did my internship for the evil empire. No, that is not the Disney Corporation. That is the U.S. government. And my internship was somewhat of an accident. I, uh, I was at the career fair at the end of the semester last year. And I must have passed the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office booth like three times. I'm not exactly a law student. I'm not even a pre-law student. And then I finally go up to his booth because he's just standing there and nobody's going out there and I kind of feel bad. And I talked to him. He said, oh, what are you trying to recruit for? He said, oh, we're looking for law interns. I said, well, I'm not really a law person. And I said, well, what are the divisions? And he had all the divisions, the criminal division, the civil division, the DEA, and then there were the admin divisions like HR and the admin division itself. And I thought the best chance of hearing back from these people in my infinite wisdom 
would be if I wrote any on the blank. How it normally works, apparently, is based on the one that you choose, you get interviewed by that department head. So when they call me back for the interview, I go, I go into the room, and there are nine people in this room. <laughs> there are nine people in this room. These are the higher up department heads for the Northern District of Georgia, the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Northern District of Georgia, about three seconds from just screaming. But I somehow managed to do it on doing right now and keep you guys laughing. And there must have been something wrong with them because they decided they wanted me. <laughs> I found out later that they were actually fighting over me. And they ended up giving me the choice of where I wanted to go, which is how I ended up in human resources. Because they could not settle amongst themselves who would get me. <laughs> <clears throat> so what I did, I did a Division Five internship. That counts for uh, business. It's, I did the eight credit version of that, so it counted for two classes. And that was ordered in 240 hours total, not all at once, but total. Uh, and I did human resource work, I did administrative work, and then I actually, I did end up getting a little bit of legal experience. I ended up doing that most in a clerical capacity. To be a little bit more specific, the HR stuff that I did, where I did basically every aspect of HR, and for those of you who don't know what that is, I helped with the performance reviews. I documented uh, the, manage, the way that things were managed and helped them update their, their form storage, their retrieval. I updated their databases. I facilitated employee transfers and managed their database itself. I supervised virtual interviews. It's really interesting. If you're trying to get a job with the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York, and you live in Atlanta, they have you come to the local U.S. Attorney's Office. You sit down in a room in the local U.S. Attorney's Office where you live, and someone calls in from EOUSA, which is the governing body over the U.S. Attorney's Offices, and they interviewed you. It's quite a grilling interview. I always hate all these. And then, because I did this interview, I had to write an eight to ten page paper. I didn't find that out until after I finished my 15 page paper. <laughs> it's a good paper. I, I did the nature of government employment and immigration policy and I don't know why my third one isn't on there. There were actually three five-page papers. The third one that I did was the functioning and management of court cases. And then I also did my journal, which just kept up with what I was doing and whatnot. And you would do that in any internship that you do for business. And then what can you do? Well, I was lucky enough to get my internship at the career fair. But that is also why the Career Development of Office exists. That is also why LinkedIn exists. And that is also why Glassdoor exists. Networking, networking, networking. You might cry during this process. You will cry during this process. But you will get there. And you have no reason not to do it. I don't want to hear any excuses. OK. So if you want a government internship, if there is something wrong with you and you want to work for the U.S. government, then you need to plan a year in advance. Now you may look at me and say, well, why do I have to plan so far ahead? It's because if you want to work for the government, I don't care if it's the federal government, I don't care if it's the state government, I don't care if it's the city municipality, they have to do a background check so they can prove that you are not an axe murderer. And that background check takes several months. This internship was meant to be a summer internship. This internship ended up being a spring internship because of how long it took to process the paperwork. <laughs> always, always, 
always be organized on your paperwork for the school. I don't care if you manage to get that internship if you, and if you put in the hours, it doesn't matter if the registrar hasn't approved your internship. And you know what? Putting in that much effort just to not get academic credit for it, that's just terrible. Don't do that to yourself. Um, if you know the subject that you want to do your internship in, you want to know that person two, three months in advance. You want to make sure that someone will agree to sign off on your internship and you need to make sure that you have somebody who you can say is overseeing this internship because guess what? They aren't just going to take your word for you. Who would trust the college? Right? And then overall just keep up with those advisors, keep career development in the loop. The, and then keep the registrar in the loop. Because you don't want to end up with two weeks left in the semester and find out the registrar has never heard of you. That would just be terrible. All right, I have tried very hard to make this entertaining. <laughs> Government work is very boring. But if any of you have any questions, please ask them now. Yes? Would you consider working there full time? Absolutely, positively. It is a wonderful working environment. The stereotypes about government work are all false, and they all tend to care a lot about you. It doesn't matter what you do for the government because they want to keep you because it is so difficult to replace you. There is a ge the gentleman who recruited me to join their office left two months after I joined the office. Hopefully not because I was there, but the, he left two months after I came to, to go work in Utah to oversee some sort of nuclear power plant. And it has been several, several months. They don't even know who's going to replace me. It is certainly not made easier by the uh, hiring policies that are put in place by the current administration. It was already very difficult under any presidency. It has been made much more difficult under the current administration. On that same note, I, I really wanted to get a job for the, for the government. They honestly, they have killer benefits. The compensation isn't bad for entry level employees, but you need to get the approval of the Deputy Attorney General if you want to work for the U.S. Attorney's Office. And I had a miscommunication with my boss that all she needed to hire me was the approval of the Deputy Attorney General. So me, in my infinite wisdom and my infinite optimism, thought it was a good idea to email the Deputy Attorney General and ask him to give me a job. I nearly got fired because of that. Do not email the Deputy Attorney General. Do not email the CEO of the corporation unless you know them personally. Do not put yourself in the awkward scenario in which you almost get yelled at by a U.S. attorney. Because that is not fun. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? I hope this has been very entertaining. I tried my hardest. Thank you very much. I, it, it, the latest statistics, although partially my personal leanings, have been sort of like government approved, but the latest statistics show that not only are the benefits better than the private sector, as they've almost always been, but actually the pay has come up and is yes. comparable to, or in some cases, in excess of the private sector. The way that the payment scaling works is that there are several grades if you're in a uh, and administrative staff, and every year or two the pay goes up by a certain margin, and then after you finish your grade, you can apply to go up to another grade, and then there's a locality adjustment. I believe the entry level grade for someone in my position, not counting the, the extremely good health benefits that you get is somewhere around the ballpark of 33 to 35,000. But then you get 
your health care is perfect. You don't you will never have to worry about it if you get and then to add to that the retirement benefits are actually better in the long run. Uh, <clears throat> you make one percent of your income for every year that you were there. So if you, you after you work twenty years, you're on the bridge of six figures and you get one percent of your income for every year that you work there. So if you make a hundred grand and you work there for twenty five years, you get twenty five grand for the rest of your life. And that is not bad. Not with health benefits, that's for certain. It's very expensive. Well thank you, James. And we're running pretty good. How was my time? Uh, you're right about on. We're right about on. Good. We're not doing bad. You guys are doing good. The only problem is I'm not sure I've got your slides yet. Thought I did. Uh oh. Let's see what we Tomato, you have the number two, which is a perfectly good tomato. 
Uh, it's sold at a discounted rate and it still flies off the shelves. It helps cut down their costs. Their costs. Um, there's no not as much waste. And another thing they do after that one week, um, we have local farmers come in at the end of the week. They pick up that produce that's not like, so some people might not eat it anymore, but their pigs don't care, their cows don't care. Um, so on the menu of those pigs and cows, we have common things like tomatoes, potatoes. You won't feed them limes, but you can feed them this, that funny looking brown thing is a yuca. We get, they get their food from Mexico. So you have kind of exotic. Their market is small grocery stores, so Mexican, Asian, those markets, that's what they primarily sell to. That's why they're so popular because you can't get these things from Florida. And they get those by their 11 tractor trailers. Those are the 16 wheelers, they're huge. They have, they have routes going as far as Texas. They often go up to the Carolinas, to Tennessee. Uh, they have 15 box trucks. They have they have like 25 million sales. So you've never heard of them, but they're doing pretty well. So my duties there was just the typical administrative thing at first, um, but I also I most primarily went on the weekends and uh, those truck the truck drivers are up at all times of the day. So I was there like 5 a.m. Uh, I was their support if they had trouble like finding a place and they couldn't get in contact with them. I was their contacts. Um, I would tell customers where the produce was at when they would get there approximately. And so my advice to you guys is don't just get the internship because you get the experience and you get paid. So I had kind of an impact on them because I helped them with the research on this healthy produce I learned in Dr. Miller's class. We helped develop this line of number two produce that's saving them a ton of money. And I uh, brought the GPS skills that a lot of older people don't know. So the truck has got a little bit better. <laughs> Specific question for anyone in particular. Not a question yet, but I recommend the career fair here. I talked to a lot of people, and a lot of people got back to me. Well, if they're going to say something about the career fair, then I think the accounting major should say something about the accounting perception. I did get three internships through the accounting perception. How about that? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, if you're an accountant, that's like the most massive asset that they offer here. Like at the last one, just talking about my internship I have right now, I was talking to EY about it and they knew about it and it was just an insane connection. Yeah. And even if it doesn't sound like an internship that you want to do, you never know. Before this, I am an international studies and Spanish major. I've never touched business before I took business classes because I had to finish up my credits. And that and now the HR component of my internship is the biggest selling point of my 
of my resume. I'm very likely I'm going to get a job in HR because of this internship. Yeah, that's an excellent point. You know, even a bad internship will teach you a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and an incredible amount. You'll learn an incredible amount. If nothing else, then it's something you don't want to do, or people you don't want to work for. And you know what? I'm an international studies major, and I'm a Spanish major, but it connected really nicely because I'm taking uh, principles of management, and um, it, like I said, it's gonna be my career. And you never know. Other questions? Sorry. How about if we talk about Go ahead. I have a question. Um, Jay listed uh, writing as being a really critical skill that she brought in and was successful. Um, did the rest of you who didn't necessarily write that, did you find that in your um, internships that you had to develop that it was important to be able to communicate well in writing? I, I would say that that's a point where a workbook ends up being an advantage. I don't know if everybody knows this, but the fact that a workbook makes you write a five-page minimum paper compared to other schools that where five pages is considered a lot, where I actually have, have to regularly write, you know, eight, nine, ten, that's one of the things where Oglethorpe works in your favor. And there's also, um, there are career fairs that are hosted by the Office of Career Development that I go to and I'm the only Oglethorpe student there. So people, you need to really go make friends in the Office of Career Development and ask them what's going on because I'm a senior and I don't need to be the only person going to these things anymore. There needs to be other people going to these things. Yeah, same with, uh, for me, um, emails, if you like messed up on an email and didn't use the proper grammar, it was always, it can be pretty embarrassing. But uh, what I noticed, most people that I work with, they all go to Georgia Tech and we take more writing classes and have bigger papers than they do. Communication skills. One of the themes, as I was, uh, several of you mentioned, follow up. Oh, yeah. It's it's nice to be able to click a box and get an internship. Doesn't work that way. You know what? You, it's groundwork. It's follow up. It's it's a bunch of leads that go nowhere. It's follow up with emails. It's calling people. It's networking through family connections. It's career development, the accounting receptions, and everything else. But it's just a numbers game. And you know what? Go through uh, the Office of Alumni Relations, too. Because yep. I promise you there are plenty of Oglethorpe alumni that want to work with Oglethorpe students. And you don't know how... Oglethorpe is small, but you would be surprised where Oglethorpe ne Oglethorpe's network goes. Yeah, that's a great point, too. I mean, the nice thing about a small college university like this is the sense of community and closeness that everyone achieves. Right? That continues on. I just went back to my third decade little plus reunion from a small private college the same way and I'm still connected with these guys in front of them. The college has been here 175 years. We've got people in chief executive office positions and managers positions and just starting positions all over the southeast. And most of them don't mind the little hand. It's all follow up. It's, it's bug the crew. <laughs> the alumni office, that's the way we get a lot of our connections to the accounting receptions and the accounting makers. The more annoying you are, the more reliable you look via email and the more they will remember who you are. So, In a professional way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Uh, I also mentioned who, I think, Michael, you mentioned it. GPA. Yeah. Uh, whenever I talk to somebody, their first question was, what's your GPA? I mean, it's really important to have, you know, above, at least above 3.0, because if you can say that, then they know that you are willing to learn and you can learn. So, yeah, it's really not, from my experience in industry, it's really not, oh, this person's brighter and knows more accounting or management or anything. 
It's that this person has the self-discipline to sit down and go through the brouhaha and take the test and get a 3.0. So I know they can sit down and learn my business and learn what I need them to know. So it's unfortunate, but many businesses, larger companies, have just set 3.0 as a cutoff. They won't even talk to you for that. And unfortunately, in the accounting realm, it's gotten even higher. <laughs> That's not to say that if you have that if you have a lower GPA that you can't get an internship. No. It's just a little bit more networking at that it point. It is just more follow-up. Because then it becomes you need someone in your corner rather than someone just taking your word for it on an anonymous application. I thought another interesting point couple of you made was, uh, and one of the things that we as faculty are trying to take to heart is Excel. We yeah. yeah. really should have an Excel class, for sure. That's a, that's well, we are attempting to integrate it more and more into all of your classes. Yeah, there are, so I know that you, unfortunately, it's one of those things where if you don't continually use it, you kind of lose it, right? I know there used to be an Excel class here, because yeah. I, I was talking to one of them. Now it's been integrated into the business yes. analytics course as okay. sort of the foundation. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to be doing bits and pieces of it in every class. So yeah, you'll love it. It's an important skill um, to have just because when it comes to dealing with financials or even just um, analyzing big data, um, Excel makes it very easy. Yeah, it's very valuable to also get an Excel certification. I know a ton of places out of that they ask. If you had that. Yeah. That's a, that's a good one. I love that. So anything else in summary, guys, that you'd like to say? Any other final questions? We're running time on time. No. So everybody's ready to go get an internship tomorrow. <laughs> Actually, that's another point they made. It won't be tomorrow, unless you're incredibly lucky. You've got to plan ahead and start working on it now. It's not one of those things where you can do it all the night before. Uh, Especially when it comes to overflow paperwork, don't be that patient. Yeah. It will, it will, we will slow you down here. But also, just getting one landed is, is kind of tough. So uh, we all fight that monster of procrastination. <laughs> whip, whip, the, whip the beast into the corner and start working on it now. Start networking now. Anything else, guys? Thank you very much. <laughs>